My name is Catherine Martin. It's a beautiful day. I'd like to welcome all of you here to the unceded territory of my ancestors, the Olnu, the Mi'kmaq. And I'd like to also remember today as an important day for us to remember all of those who are suffering from violence for gender, for um, race, uh, for just being who they are. Um, and especially during this time of reconciliation with Canada and the First Nation peoples, I'd like to remember all of those from this region and across the country who have gone missing or murdered from the Indigenous population, as well as all Canadians and all women um, and men around the world who have suffered and are missing or murdered. Um, welcome to the territory, welcome to this evening, and I hope that um, you enjoy the wonderful speakers that we have uh, with us tonight. Walaliok and Sitnogama. Thank you, Kathy, for that Mi'kmaq welcome. Good evening. I am Teresa Rajak Talley, the Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion at Dalhousie University. I would like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is situated in Chibuktuk, Halifax, the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation, who have been here for over 10,000 years. Welcome to the fifth in our series, Speak Truth to Power Forum. Today, the theme focuses on eliminating gender-based violence. We chose today, November 25th, because this date holds historically the date of 1960, the assassination of three women, the Mirabal sisters, who were political activists in the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. and who were 
ordered to be killed by the then director of that country. On December 17, 1999, the date was finally received its official um, acclamation by the United Nations for us to organize and support the day as international observance. On November 25, 2013, the then UN Secretary General stated, I welcome the chorus of voices calling for an end to the violence that affects an estimated of one in every three women in our lifetime. I applaud the leaders who are helping to enact and enforce laws and change mindsets. And I pay tribute to all those around the world who help victims to heal and to become agents of change. This forum tonight gives us an opportunity to add our voices to those around the world who are actively seeking and working towards the elimination of all gender-based violence. The theme was selected for this reason, but also because gender-based violence continues and is now observed in several other capacities and areas. For example, as the world, including Canada and Nova Scotia, is retreating for the second time inside our houses due to the lockdown measures introduced to curb COVID-19 pandemic, reports are showing an alarming increase in the already existing pandemic of violence among BIPOC households. A situation where a member of our esteemed panel will share more information with us. This month is also significant to focus on the topic because the second week in November is Transgen Transgender Awareness Week, which leads up to Transgender Day of Remembrance, which memorializes victims of transphobic violence. As such, we want to pause, take a deep breath, and listen to others on this panel as they educate us and make us aware of the transgender experience of violence. Their participants, Although for these two reasons, we are using November to highlight gender-based violence, there is no one month or one year where gender-based violence does not occur. So today, as part of our forum, we are also remembering December 6, 1989, when a gunman walked into Ecole Polytechnique de Montreal and killed 14 women. During the rampage, the man who had failed to gain admission to the university shouted, you are all a bunch of feminists, and I hate feminists. Most of those women were studying to be engineers. engineers. We are so honored to have two of Dalhousie's engineering students to enlighten us on what happened then and what still continues in their field. Before I introduce my co-host, Lisa DeLong, who's the Director for Human Rights and Equity Services, there are a few housekeeping notes. First. We will be inviting our guest speakers to join in accordance with the program. Unfortunately, one of our panelists, Karen Bernard, director of the Jane Paul Indigenous Women Resource Center, sends her regret and is unable to join us. Another housekeeping note is that everyone's camera and microphones have been turned off to ensure that only our guests are on screen as needed. Unfortunately, there's no chat feature for the event but please ask your question through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. These questions are being monitored and will be answered as needed. This event will be recorded and used as an educational tool for future reference. As this is a virtual event, it is possible that we may experience technical difficulties. We appreciate your patience if any such delays happen. So without further ado, let me introduce my co-host, Lisa M. DeLong. Lisa is the Director for Human Rights and Equity Services, an office dedicated to fostering a climate of respect and inclusion at Dalhousie University. In this capacity, Lisa oversees the administration of three university policies, the Statement on Prohibited Discrimination, the Personal Harassment Policy, and the Sexual Violence Policy. Currently, we are actively working to develop our racialized violence policy. Lisa holds a Master of Laws from Dalhousie and a Bachelor of Law from the University of Ottawa. 
a fun fact of Lisa is that she also got her Bachelor of Arts here at Dalhousie in theater. And she holds a certificate in conflict management. Lisa, please introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Teresa. And thank you everyone for coming. Gender-based violence is, uh, you know, affects all of us. And so I really appreciate your engagement and participation in this really important um, and crucial conversation, particularly right now in the context of a pandemic, as we know, is um, profound. So thank you so much for coming. I'm going to introduce um, the bios of our speakers tonight, and I'll continue to introduce them as they're about to speak. So our first speaker tonight is Dr. Nancy Ross, who is an assistant professor at the School of Social Work at Dalhousie University. Dr. Ross has a PhD. Her previous work as a clinical therapist in mental health and addiction services motivates her research interests in calling attention to, to the prevalence and impacts of adverse childhood experiences and gendered violence and in defining better measures of intervention and prevention. She applies a feminist peace building and trauma informed lens that acknowledges structural and cultural forms of violence are inseparable from direct forms of violence. This analysis moves from a narrow focus on individual responsibility to encompass a wider analysis of the social, cultural, economic, and political origins of violence to ultimately comp compel community responses. So welcome, um, Dr. Ross, we're, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. Our second speaker tonight will be Afolake Aoiga, who is a clinical social worker with experience in community development and working with immigrants and other marginalized populations. Her most recent experience has been working at the IWK Children's Health Center and as part-time sessional instructor at Dal the Dalhousie School of Social Work. She is a member of the Nova Scotia Advers Advers Advisory Council on the Status of Women. Afolake is also a member of the Board of Examiners for the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers. She is a co-founder of Generation One Leadership Initiative, a support and educational group for youth and families of African descent. She previously worked as a healthcare social worker with the Nova Scotia Health Authority and as a child protection worker with the Department of Community Services. Afolake is, an ins is inspired daily by her husband and their two teenage children. She would like to pay tribute to the many nameless and unrecognized women whose work makes it possible for her today. Our third speaker tonight is Sierra Sparks. Sierra is an engineering student at Dalhousie University and just this week was announced as Dalhousie's 92nd Road Scholar. Sierra is a senior year electrical engineering student at Dalhousie University specializing in biomedical engineering. She's been actively involved with the engineering community within Nova Scotia and across Canada, holding leadership positions with the Dalhousie Undergraduate Engineering Society and the Canadian Federation of Engineering Students. She's passionate about increasing the number of women in underrepresented and underrepresented youth in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics called STEM, which she does through her involvement with the Women in Engineering Society and through an African Nova Scotian math tutoring program. Sierra wishes to continue to be an advocate and role model for young people in and outside of engineering. Outside of her studies, she's an active rugby player with her school's club and enjoys composing music and playing piano in her free time. Our fourth speaker tonight is Rowan Natasha Pratt, an engineering student with Dalhousie University. Rowan, who goes by she, her, they, them, is a neurodiverse, queer, disabled, non-binary woman in her third year of civil engineering at Dalhousie University, located in Tjibuktuk. They've been active within the engineering community, holding leadership positions with the Dalhousie undergraduate engineering student, Jack Orr, Dalenge, TEDx Dalhousie U, the Atlantic Council of Engineering Students, and the Canadian Federation of Engineering Students. She's an ardent advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as mental health awareness. Rowan is an intersectional feminist and, in, and environmentalist in progress, always seeking to learn and grow. Her hope is to continue to break down barriers by using her voice to create change and to empower others to do the same by sharing her experiences. Her goal is con to continue to fight for EDI within engineering. Beyond their studies, they are a dancer, artist, and lover of the outdoors. Our fifth speaker this evening is Dr. Tammy Meredith, she, her. Dr. Tammy Meredith is a trans woman navigating the complexities of teaching and working as an instructor within the Faculty of Computer Science. She's on the board of directors of the Nova Scotia Rainbow Action Project and the Coverdale Courtwork Society as part of her advocacy efforts for marginalized communities. When she isn't pursuing her passion and working on behalf of the queer community, she hangs out with her cat and fish, enjoys online gaming, and is an avid crafter. 
So I know you'll all join me together tonight in welcoming all of our speakers. And we'll begin now with our first speaker, Dr. Nancy Ross. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. <clears throat> okay, I would like to thank Dr. Teresa Ann Rajakali for the invitation to speak this evening on this important topic and April DeLorme Provo for her work in coordinating the event. I'm going to introduce this topic, provide a few uh, definitions, address the scope of this issue, and an invitation to imagine a nonviolent world and define subsequent action. I'm going to introduce this topic, provide a few uh, definitions, address the scope of this issue, and an invitation to imagine a nonviolent world and define subsequent action. <clears throat> During the first few months of the pandemic, the media posted news stories of the largest mass shooting in Canadian history in our own province in Porta Peak. It depicted images of global marches against anti-Black racism and described marked increases in violence against women and children, all while social isolation or distancing measures were enforced. These early months of the pandemic were characterized by hoarding and fear, and at the same time, acts of generosity and a swiftness of innovative responses unimagined before the pandemic. Examples included new housing options for the homeless, releasing inmates from prison, and a renewed call for equitable access to a living wage for all. The implications of COVID-19 pandemic signal both tragedy and possibility. I would like to consider the amplification of the current, concurrent pandemics of violence against women and children during the COVID-19 pandemic as a renewed call to action. The enforced pause as a result of social isolation or distancing measures in response to COVID-19 has led many people to reimagine a different world and ignited social movements across the globe. Critically reflecting on this issue can provide opportunities to harness such imaginings in redefining the possible in the quest for a more equitable and safer world. My comments this evening describe the potential of the pandemic to subvert the pervasive influence of gender-based violence by promoting collective notions of care. While many forms of violence in the world have decreased, including the number of wars on our planet, the rates of gender-based violence remain astoundingly high, particularly during this pandemic. Gender-based violence is an umbrella term for any harmful act that is perpetrated against a person's will and that is based on socially ascribed gender differences between males and females. Gender-based violence has been referred to as domestic violence, violence against women, intimate partner terrorism, and includes violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people, and sexual violence. The United Nations 1993 Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women defines it as any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of such acts, coercion, or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or in private life. It is difficult to obtain exact numbers about rates of gender-based violence because it is often shrouded in secrecy and shame. Experiencing violence often by a person you love harms your sense of safety, negatively impacts your self-esteem, and can result in feelings of helplessness and fear, not to mention the, name, the range of physical harms. It is also referred to as relational injury. It can become normalized as something to be endured to survive. Many people who experience violence in their relationships would like the violence to end, but may wish to remain in the relationship and keep their family together. Therefore, for a multitude of reasons, it is often not reported to the police, and we lack precise statistics about how often it occurs. It is estimated that less than 10% of sexual assaults and less than 16% of domestic violence is reported to the police. 
The World Health Organization reports that physical or sexual violence is experienced by more than one third of women globally. And one in three adults report having witnessed violence in their childhood home. In Canada, research indicates that as many as half of Canadian women experience physical or sexual violence at some time in their lives. Over half of the children in the world, estimated at 1 billion, experience the most severe forms of violence between the ages of 2 and 17 each year. And this includes witnessing their mother experience gender-based violence. Over the past 40 years in Canada, a troubling statistic remains persistent. One woman or girl is killed every other day. According to the results of a Statistics Canada survey about the impacts of COVID-19 released in April 2020, one in 10 women are very or extremely concerned about the possibility of violence in their home due to stress of confinement. As I said, experiences of violence are often shrouded by silence, secrecy, and denial. However, for those who work in the anti-violence field, the awareness of the pervasive nature of gender-based violence is a daily burden. It affects us all. Violence in relationships always has a spillover effect to other people that can last for generations. We also know that the impacts of witnessing and or being a victim of violence can influence the next generation. The high cost of violence against women are often invisible. For example, women who experience violence at the hands of their partners are six times more likely to be depressed. According to the World Health Organization, violence experienced during pregnancy and early motherhood can cause a high degree of stress and anxiety that can be passed on to affect the developing fetus and young child. Experience of violence can include psychological violence, stalking, physical violence, forced marriages, sexual violence, female genital mutilation, sexual harassment, cyber violence, and human trafficking. Those who are socially, racially, and economically marginalized in Canada experience increased vulnerability to gender-based violence and harm within the criminal justice system response. Authors Kristoff and Wu Dung in their book, Half the, Half the Sky, describe achieving gender equity and ending men's violence against girls and women as a moral challenge of the 21st century. Jimmy Carter has described the deprivation and abuse of women and girls as the most serious and unaddressed world, challenge worldwide. He is a former uh, American president who works globally on this issue of gender-based violence. Maureen Flaherty succinctly characterized the lack of security in which most women in the world feel unsafe as global peacelessness. In this pandemic, many people are not safe at home and feel trapped at home, which for too many has become a dangerous place. Most couples will spend more time together at this time, which will likely lead to more arguments. Additional stress from job losses, financial hardship and uncertain futures combined with a person who chooses to use violence when things don't go well will likely result in increased domestic violence. A peace building analysis applied to violence against women, transgender people and children recognizes structural and cultural violences are inextricably linked to direct experiences of violence. This implies that our cultural values and structural inequities serve to sustain current rates of violence against women and children. An international consortium of researchers identified reducing poverty and obtaining wage equity for women as a first step in responding to violence against women and children during a pandemic. In order to do so, the highly competitive and alienating values of neoliberalism must be subverted and replaced by a society that pri prioritizes collective care and concern for those experiencing inequity and oppression. Feminists advocate for the provision of wage parity in every industry. 
the mandatory presence of women on corporate boards, more equitable access to capital for women-owned businesses, and school curriculums that teach children about healthy gender roles and relationships at every age as necessary responses. Building a peaceful world for all must focus on the restoration of relationships, the creation of just social systems, and nonviolent conflict resolution. All of us can remember we are all in this together, and that stressful times can lead to positive change and sometimes bring forth the best in us, kindness, compassion, and a commitment to social equity. You can advocate for the government to include econ economic strengthening programs so that no families are living below the poverty line because a large body of literature links economic insecurity to violence against women and children. We can make a decision to reach out to three people a day by phone, FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, or WhatsApp to let them know they may be practicing social distancing but do not have to feel isolated. Violence against women and children flourishes in isolation, silence, and secrecy. You can ask someone you suspect might be experiencing violence at home if they are okay and tell them that many women experience this form of violence and it is not okay and that the first step to things getting better is to talk about it. The emblem of Nova Scotia stating strong together implies that our response to violence must be collective and implicates societal and political responses. We have the power. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. Wonderful comments. I really appreciated your comments, particularly around wage equity and the fact that that enables autonomy for for women to be able to move forward to, um, you know, enable their children to uh, carry some sense of normalcy to now enable survivors to foster conditions again to to enable children to move forward. So I really, really so appreciate your thoughts on this. Our next speaker tonight is Afalake Awoyiga and um, Dr. Um, Ross. Thank you so much. Afalake now will will join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you to the organizers of this event for the opportunity to participate on this distinguished panel. I would like to start with an Audrey Lord quote, which states, I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. I'm starting with this quote because it is clear to me that the rise in gender-based violence is a sign of deepening and frightening loss of our collective humanity and compassion. Compassion. Therefore, I feel it's important for us to recognize that gender-based violence is devastating not only for the individuals who directly experience it and their families, but for our entire communities, regardless of our gender, race, class, citizenship status, family composition, finances, and so on. And because gender-based violence prevents individuals from reaching their full potentials, we all lose. Personally, I have witnessed gender-based violence in different contexts, from female genital mutilation to open sexual harassment in public spaces in Nigeria, and some of it through my frontline work here in Canada, Nova Scotia. It is important to note that while violence affects people of all genders, ages, abilities, cultures, ethnicities, geographic locations, socioeconomic status, religion, sexual orientation, seniors, children, and youth, no segments of society are immune from the vestiges of this problem. Yet, gender-based violence has been particularly harmful with, within the indigenous communities communities of African ancestry, immigrant and refugee, and other racialized or marginalized population of women. However, for this panel discussion, I've been asked to speak about the impact of gender-based violence on marginalized population of women, such as black or racialized women, immigrant and refugee women, and the impact on families and children. I will be looking at gender-based violence, I am looking at gender-based violence as a public health 
and a global human rights problem. Therefore, my hope is to analyze gender-based violence from an intersectional trauma and health viewpoint. Before we proceed, given that I'm looking at this topic from an inter intersectional and trauma lens, I thought it would be good to take a couple of minutes to define and review the concept of intersectionality and trauma. Intersectionality is the idea that people experience discrimination in different ways and in varying degrees of intensity based on social categorizations, such as their race, class, gender, ability, and sexuality, to name a few, which are connected and cannot be viewed independently. The term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 to highlight the unique experiences of marginalization that African-American women face. She used the term intersectionality to explain how African-American women experience overlapping types of marginalization in places such as domestic violence services and anti-discrimination law. With such a broad definition, intersectionality can be a confusing concept to grasp. But the most important message to take away is that there is no one size fits all approach when it comes to understanding and preventing gender-based violence. It is a concept that allows us to keep an open mind when thinking about the different ways in which people experience gender-based uh, violence. It is a concept that allows us to realize each woman experience this issue in a different way and may face additional barriers based on race, sexuality, age, and ability. How, what about trauma? When we look and when we talk about trauma, trauma event, traumatizing events contain three elements. It's unexpected, the person was unprepared, and there's nothing that that person could have done to prevent it from happening. In the case of gender-based violence, the impact is traumatic, not only for the victims, but for the children, families, and their community as a whole. So just to talk about marginalized population of women, from an intersectional viewpoint, marginalized women face worse outcomes of gender-based violence due to multiple stressors related to their position in society. For instance, immigrant women's stress comes from multiple sources of vulnerability, such as undocumented status and reluctance to seek care because of concerns about mistreatment. Immigrant and refugee women. Some immigrant and refugee women face additional types of violence, such as immigration-related abuse through threats and violence by their partners. A woman's immigration status not only heightens her vulnerability to violence, but it can also exacerbate the nature of the violence she experiences. Some of the factors that contribute to risk and vulnerabilities associated with gender-based violence in the immig immigrant and refugee communities are fear of deportation, language barriers, risk of homelessness, social stigma, economic and financial dependence on partner, fear of losing permanent residency, and fear of losing custody of their children. For example, immigrant women with status can face manipulation by their partner in ways, partner, in ways that are tied to their newcomer experience. They may be prohibited from learning English or French or from working, which further isolates them. Let's talk about Black women. While preparing for this panel discussion, I was astonished at the lack of literature on the impact of gender-based violence on African-Canadian women. What I found was largely on African-American women. So the impact of gender-based violence on Black women of African descent that I will be talking about here today is in the context of African-Americans from an article written by Tricia Ben Goodley, a researcher and clinical social worker and professor at the Howard University of Social Work. However, I want to highlight that there are lots of similarities in the experiences of African-American and African-Canadian women. We need to get more research on the Canadian side. So Ben Goodley states that African-American women suffer with greater lethality and more severe injuries other than racial and other, other, than other racial and ethnic groups as a result of gender-based violence. And similar to what obtained here in Canada, there are limited culturally-based services available to assist this client population. 
African American women are more likely to be resistant to services for fear of being treated poorly or being misunderstood. They are when African American women who have experienced gender based violence have been more likely to experience poorer health, chronic pain, memory loss, spontaneous and induced abortion, and greater abuse during pregnancy. The connection between gender based violence and HIV has also received increasing attention. A good example of the impact of gender-based violence on Black women is Anita Hill. She made history in 1991 when she testified before US Congress about the sexual harassment she said she had experienced while she was an aide to Clarence Thomas, a Supreme Court nominee who had been her supervisor at the time. I encourage you to check it out. Impact of gender-based violence on children because it does have a you know, spillover effect on children. Children may come to accept, one of the ways that it impacts children is that children may come to accept violence as an alternative means of conflict resolution and communication. It is in these ways that violence is reproduced and perpetuated. Children who witness domestic violence are at increased risk of anxiety, depression, low self-esteem and poor school performance. Among other uh, problems that that among, among other problems that harm their well being and personal development. Research shows that children of abused women are likely to repeat a school year and leave school early than other children. Children of both boys and girls who have witnessed or suffered from gender based violence are more likely to become victims and abusers later in life. Research has revealed that boys who witness their father using violence against their mothers were three times more likely to use violence against their partners later in their lives. So increased risk of growing to be either a perpetrator or a victim of violence themselves. Beyond the direct and short-term consequences, child witnesses of violence are more likely to have emotional and behavioral problems as well. So how does gender-based violence spill over into relationships as Nancy has said? To put to contextualize that, at the family level, gender-based violence can threaten family structures leading to inability to carry out daily activities and children suffer emotional damage when they watch their mothers and sisters being battered. It also has an impact on marginalized women's health as the trauma can dysregulate and recalibrate environmentally sensitive physiological systems, placing individuals who directly experience it at risk for multiple health problems. The other thing I wanted to highlight before I go is that on, you know, there is also the issue of underreporting of gender-based violence among marginalized women. As a result of the social stigma, most survivors never report the incident. So it should be understood and expected that gender-based violence, especially in marginalized communities are underreported. My recommendations for, for in order to kind of move forward or to, to uh, improve on this is to use a culturally responsive and trauma-informed model with the assumption that any woman who walks through our door has experienced violence. And also use community-based interventions, a race and gender analysis to strengthen the capacity of individuals and organizations at the community level, including faith-based organizations to address the health of victims of gender-based violence uh, from marginalized uh, communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Afalaki. Wonderful comments. I so appreciated uh, all of your comments, but in particular, the lack of culturally appropriate services, the resistance to accessing services. And this year in particular, I think it's been a very public um, awareness of the impact of engaging with various services and what that can mean in terms of, you know, risk to, to life and well-being, but also the impact on children and the role that peers and friends and neighbors can play in either supporting or actually exacerbating the, the harm in really powerful ways. So, so thank you so much for that, for that uh, very helpful perspective. Um, thank you, Lisa. Next, thank you. Our next speaker tonight is um, Sierra Lewis. And so, so Sierra will be joining us. Um, excuse me, just Sierra Sparks, I'm sorry, will be joining us tonight and we'll be speaking on um, experience of an engineering student. Thank you so much, Sierra. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be on this panel um, and to learn from all of the panelists as well. Um, so I'm going to be talking about 
you know, as an engineering student, uh, one of the biggest events of gender-based violence um, in Canadian history actually is the Montreal massacre of December 6th, 1989. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that and how that's impacted the engineering profession and kind of looking forward. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So yeah, I'm just going to introduce, uh, you know, give a little bit of background. Uh, I know that for me personally, I hadn't heard of the Montreal massacre until university and when I was in engineering. Uh, I wanted to highlight the 14 women um, of the Montreal massacre, uh, talk about the impact of it, and then what we can do moving forward. Next slide, please. So now into the introduction. So just to give a little bit of history on the Montreal massacre or the, um, the mass shooting of December 6th, 1989, um, a gunman walked into the engineering building at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal and killed 14 women. And so as Dr. Rajat Tali mentioned, uh, during the rampage, the, the man who was uh, not admitted to the engineering program at Ecole Polytechnique uh, shouted, you're all a bunch of feminists and I hate feminists. And so most of those women were studying to be engineers uh, and you know, his attack was very uh, pointed in that he wanted to um, specifically target women engineers and to a point where he went into a mechanical and materials engineering classroom and told all of the men to go to one side and uh, so that they wouldn't be shot. Um, so the gunman believed that these women took a place in engineering that rightfully belonged to him. Uh, and he truly believed that women did not belong in engineering, which really incited this uh, terrible act of gender-based violence. Next slide, please. So why did this happen? Um, and kind of what was the motive? Uh, so immediately after the shootings, a lot of, you know, the media was, obviously this was a huge deal. This was at the time, um, and unfortunately now with the Nova Scotian shootings, um, that is now the deadliest mass shooting in Canadian history. But at the time, this was uh, the deadliest mass shooting in Canadian history. And so this was all over the news, all across Canada, and everyone was trying to find what the motive was. And people didn't want to believe that it was incited by an act of gender-based violence. So commentators were saying that, you know, uh, we shouldn't be blaming the shooter because of uh, because he was a madman is what they were labeling him as, and that the woman just happened to be in the way, um, as opposed to being specifically targeted. Um, you know, even psychiatrists were saying that uh, the mass shooter was as innocent as his victims, and he was just a victim of an increasingly merciless society. So now that we look back at it now, um, and even kind of years after it happened, uh, we know that there was in fact a motive and that was um, specifically uh, because he wanted to target these women. So this was a period of a significant growth in men's rights groups. Uh, that's from you know, Martin Dufresne, uh, who is the founder of Men Against Sexism, a group active at the time of the massacre. Um, but at the time, the public felt too uncomfortable with the political explanation. And we see that today as well. Um, you know, people often don't get to the root cause because they're afraid to say, you know, what the true motives are. And oftentimes it is laid in gender-based violence. And police actually refused at the beginning to go public with the killer's suicide note because they didn't want to inspire copycat killings and also did not want to um, essentially reveal to the world that this was an act of gender-based violence. Um, but when you read the note, uh, which read, would you note that if I committed suicide today, it is not for economic reasons, but for political reasons, because I have decided to send the feminists who have always ruined my life to their maker. I have decided to put an end to their viragos. So as you can tell from that, he was very clearly motivated to, um, you know, he very much did not think that women deserve to be studying engineering and you know it is a typically male dominated field and he felt that his place was taken by these women. Uh, next slide please. So I did uh, you know I didn't want to talk about this without um, you know remembering the 14 women so I just wanted to uh, 
uh, name all of the 14. So 12 of them were engineering students. Um, one was actually a budget clerk in the building and one was a nursing student who was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. So it's Jean-Fievre Bergeron, Hélène Colgan, Nathalie Croteau, Barbara Degno, Anne-Marie Edouard, Maud Havianic, Maris Laganière, Maris Leclerc, Anne-Marie Lemay, Sonia Pelletier, Michel Richard, Annie Saint Arnaud, Annie Turcotte, and Barbara Kluznik Wujadwitz. So I just wanted to, those are the 14 women in the photo on the left uh, with credits to Radio Canada. And, you know, in these acts of violence, it's really important to be remembering the victims rather than um, the person who insinuated this act of violence. Next slide, please. So with that, um, the, you know, this was felt across Canada. Like I said, this was um, for 30 years, the deadliest mass shooting in Canadian history. And that led parliament to designate December 6th as the national day um, in Canada of remembrance and action against on violence against women. So this is also kind of observed by engineering schools across Canada because it's felt very deep in the engineering community at large. So vigils are held on December 6th each year to commemorate the victims and to continue to stand up for gender diversity in engineering and put a stop to violence against uh, women. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk about some of the impacts of uh, this event. Next slide, please. So, you know, these 14 women have really been paving the way for other women to be in the profession. Uh, so they've really been instrumental in the fight for eliminating gender-based violence and in striving to increase equity and diversity in engineering and other science, technology, engineering, and math fields or STEM as it's commonly referred. So, I wanted to highlight this quote from the late feminist writer, Andrea Dorkin. Um, it is incumbent upon each of us to be the woman that Mark Lepin, which was the shooter, wanted to kill. We must live with this honor, this courage. We must drive out fear. We must hold on, we must create, we must resist. And so, you know, myself as a woman engineering student, I feel this responsibility every day. And I know that um, my peers feel this responsibility every day. Um, and it's because of these 14 women that, you know, I have a place in engineering and I know that I have a place in engineering. Next slide, please. So it, as I mentioned, it's no longer the deadliest um, mass shooting, but it is still the deadliest act of gender-based violence in Canadian history. Um, but that being said, you know, the stories of these 14 women, you know, a lot of them were very close to graduation. This was, you know, in December 6th, which is in the middle of exams. A lot of them were finalizing their career plans and had really amazing futures ahead of them and were really high achieving individuals. Um, and, you know, a lot of scholarships and a lot of, uh, you know, fellowships and just highlighting, you know, the successes of women in the engineering career have been made in their honor. So on the 30th anniversary of the incident, which was actually last year in 2019 in December, um, a special event was held to commemorate the victims uh, to discuss the impact that this act of violence had on the engineering profession. And a list of 30 influential women in engineering was circulated by Engineers Canada um, in honor of these 14 women to celebrate women in the profession. Um, next slide, please. So moving forward, what can we do to remember this and um, make sure that we are actively standing up against gender-based violence? Uh, next slide. So there is still work to be done. And you know, although this does remain the deadliest act of gender-based violence in Canadian history, it was only 30 years ago. And this is still very fresh um, in a lot of Canadians' minds, uh, you know, in professors who were there at the time. Um, students who were studying alongside these women, um, and there's still work to be done uh, to eliminate the possibility of this happening again. In and outside of engineering, acts of gender-based violence continue to occur, and it, it's really up to us to learn from our history 
listen to the survivors and take action while continuing to advocate for an end to gender-based violence. Next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight this quote from the government of Canada in their um, kind of information that they have about December 6th. Um, as we mourn their loss and honor their memory, we reaffirm our commitment to fight the hatred that led to this tra tragedy and the misogyny that still exists today. In Canada and around the world, women, girls, LGBTQ and gender diverse individuals face, face an unacceptable violence and discrimination. Gender-based violence in Canada has been magnified and amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. There have been reports from police services, shelters, and local organizations of an increase in calls related to gender-based violence across Canada during the pandemic. So it really does put into per perspective that there is a lot of work to be done to eliminate gender-based violence. And although this did happen 30 years ago, we are still feeling the impacts. Um, I don't have this in the slides, but I did just very quickly want to touch on, you know, I am an engineering student and in engineering, it's one of the things that, you know, we have the opportunity to do is to design things that are going to be put out into, into society. But too often, um, the designs that engineers are making and that, you know, inventors and scientists are making are actually allowing this violence to um, occur. And so, and so one example that I just wanted to highlight is that, you know, women are actually about 47% more likely to uh, have fatal injuries when they're in a car crash, because when conducting um, crash tests in the manufacturing process, the crash test dummies are modeled after typically able-bodied men. And so that's just, you know, when you think about gender-based violence, that may not seem as uh, you know, as obvious as an example, but it's something to be aware of as well. And I just wanted to highlight that, um, you know, from the engineering perspective, um, how gender-based violence is very much pervades in our society today. And it's really important um, that we work together to, uh, you know, acknowledge it and uh, figure out ways to eliminate it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sierra. Wonderful comments. I really appreciated your perspective and thoughts. And I had actually been unaware of the initial reticence on the part of the police to disclose the fact that there was a gender element in the Montreal massacre. I was 15 at the time. And, um, you know, it really resonates, I think, right now for us here in Nova Scotia as we collectively, and I actually personally grieve the loss of a friend in our most recent shooting. So uh, a very helpful perspective and thoughts in terms of accountability and unconscious bias, right? As we, as we think about the ways that we design our systems and our programs and who they serve and who they actually don't serve in ways that ultimately can be life-threatening. So, so thank you so much for, for your comments. I'll just take this moment to remind all of our viewers that we do have a QA and a um, box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to, to drop any questions there. We've got a, a wonderful panel with, with a, a amazing expertise. So please do drop your questions. Um, our next speaker is Rowan Natasha Pratt and Natasha, is an engineering student and will be will be joining us next. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm gonna do my best to share my screen right now. Um, oh, well, it's not gonna work. So we're just not gonna do it. Cool, cool. I anticipated this happening. Um, so my name is Rowan, sorry, my pronouns are she, her, they, them, and I'm so, so, so excited to be here today. Um, I want to thank you for providing me with this opportunity to speak, and I'm so humbled to be speaking amongst such an incredible and empowering group of individuals. So I'm really nervous and anxious, so I appreciate your patience as I'm patient with myself through this talk. Um, so first I'm going to give a land acknowledgement. I know we did one at the beginning and I know we did a welcome, but I'm going to acknowledge that I am presenting to you from the unceded and, and traditional land of the Mehua people, as well as I was born a settler and raised on the Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory, which is also Ottawa, Ontario, the capital of Canada. Um, so yeah, I want you to, I wish I had my slides because they were pretty and they looked like they had trees. But um, 
go to native-land.ca and you will be able to um, find out whose land you're living on. And I think that's super important. So today, on, in terms of eliminating gender-based violence, I wanted to speak on individualistic goals, how we can work on this as individuals, individual allyship, um, and true long-term allyship. And this comes with not only eliminating, but most importantly, learning how to prevent gender-based violence. And it starts with me and you. Uh, how, how we can look inward, how we can see our inner prejudice. Yes, we all have it. Um, it will be uncomfortable. It will be super uncomfortable. Um, allowing yourself to sit in that uncomfy and experience it, that's how we begin to unlearn and grow as allies. So I would say next slide here, but don't got him. <laughs> so inclusive language is violence prevention. It's okay to make mistakes, I'll note that too. Heck, the path to true allyship requires you to make mistakes. It's how you take that bad, you learn from it, how you address it. Um, so I learned this term honestly like three hours ago and it's untapped. It's using the term untapped inst instead of marginalized or underrepresented. Um, as someone who is underrepresented, I've always felt kind of ostracized by that term and it is an ostracizing term. And so I really, really love the term untapped. So I will be using that going forward. Um, I also wanna say, don't get offended by the words racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic. Address them for what they are, acknowledge it. Um, and then on your own time, then you can address why you're defensive. Then you can address why you need to learn from this. So I'm gonna tell you a story of a mistake I made the other day. Literally so stupid. I'm, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. So my roommate is this non-binary, incredible, amazing person. And so I made this joke and it was so insensitive. Um, I said, maybe I'm a lesbian who doesn't date cis men thinking I was including non-binary folks. Also, I'm dating a cis man, but <laughs> anyways, um, they kindly called me in saying that's transphobic. And I'll tell you, it is transphobic. And I'll tell you why. Saying you're a lesbian who dates everyone except for cis men insinuates that you are, that trans men are not men. Fact, that is transphobic. Fact, trans men are men. Um, I apologized right away, corrected myself and moved on. That's all you gotta do. Don't, per don't apologize profusely. It's not on them. It's not on them to make you feel better for making the mistake. Um, I'm not a bad, bad ally, and I say this because I know how terrifying it can be to make a mistake and how easy it is to instinctively defend your actions or your intentions. That doesn't help anyone. Screaming, I am a firefighter at a, at a house that's burning down, that doesn't help anyone. Also, silence is compliance, so opting not to talk at all it's better to make the mistake than to not talk at all. Are you unsure whether the language you are using is inclusive? We are in an age where you can look it up. Super easy, super quick. I also wrote an article about inclusive language in the jack.org.eng newsletter, which you should check out. Practice with your friends, go on drives. My partner and I go on drives and practice using inclusive language, especially when our friends change which pronouns they're using. It's not on them to be there well while you learn how to figure it out. Figure it out on your own time, go on a drive, use it. Keep practicing until you get it right. Um, it's difficult conversations like these with the people in your lives that incites change as true allies. Educate yourselves. Um, and if someone's making a mistake, you then have the power to help them on their path to allyship. So when I was actually originally asked to, to speak at this conference, I'll pull it up. Um, some exclusive language was unintentionally used. And so I, as an ally, stepped forward and, and addressed this, but with, and I'm just gonna read what I said. 
I would also like to address the language we use. I first want to note that my intention here is to promote love, learning, and awareness, not to shame. Mistakes will happen as we grow as allies. In the first email, transgender people were what I like to call adjectified with adject adjective and objectified combined. It's like, a, I wish I had my slides. So to say that their identity was used as an adjective. Transgendered individuals is transphobic, exclusive language. Instead use trans women or trans men or just use men or women. It's as simple as that. Female was also used interchangeably with women. Female describes your sex at birth, not your gender. It is transphobic and exclusive to, re to refer to women as such. Not all women have vaginas. Not all women identify as female. Instead, use women. To use myself as, as an example, I was born female. I identify as a non-binary woman. I do not identify as female. As I'm not within either binary, I am trans. I too am still learning to understand my own identity and I'm literally still processing my inner transphobia because when I hear trans, I go, I'm not trans. Um, which leads me to my next slide that you cannot see, which is integration is violence prevention. So integrating this inclusive language into our academia and field is where we start. Where we continue is uplifting these people, amplifying, amplifying black voices, uplifting black indigenous, LGBTQ2 plus trans disabled voices, arts, cultures, ideals, practices, the list goes on. Abolishing this us them mentality and, 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 and instead creating this ideal that everyone belongs, everyone is welcome here, that they are valued, that they belong. What doesn't belong is discrimination, creating and, impl creating and implementing the narrative that violence towards untapped communities is shamed and punished. It is not welcome here. Seeing others like me, like Sierra, for example, she's been my inspiration since day one. Um, another um, would be Alex McDonald. Um, seeing others like me, it, it makes me feel empowered in this and makes me feel like I belong. And that's why I continue to try and break these barriers. What we need as untapped individuals, what we need to do or as allies, what we need to do is to create a safe space for these untapped individuals to tap in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rowan. Really appreciate your comments. Um, thank you. I, I really, really enjoyed your perspective in terms of what we do when we get it wrong. Um, we do. We're all on a journey in terms of learning. I am the first to, you know, apologize several times a day and take ownership for, for those um, those missteps and recognize that we're all human, but we all belong. And so, so thank you so much for that perspective and and uh, really wonderful, wonderful um, discussion. Wonderful. So our next um, and our final speaker actually tonight is Dr. Tammy Meredith. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Meredith to join us and following Dr. Meredith's comments, um, Dr. Ray Jactali, Teresa will take over with some questions. Thank you, everybody. So I'd like to start by saying, I think it's going to be a challenge to follow in the footsteps and speak as eloquently and passionately as my fellow speakers. You've really set a standard that's going to be hard to meet. Before I, went, before I get going, I want to point out that I have had to rely on my speech on a lot of international data sources, not just Canadian, because frankly, there's a lack of data available with respect to trans people. Quick example, when it comes to hormone therapy for trans women, they use data for postmenopausal women on hormone therapy because there's no data from the trans community. The last thing I wanna say before I start is I use the term trans to encompass two-spirit, transgender, transsexual, gender fluid, non-binary, and every other category of person who isn't cis. There's no good word. I can't come up with a good word. So I just use trans because it's what 
is used in academic publications, not because it's the right word, just because it's a word. So to start, I want to say it should come as no surprise that trans women are the target of violence more so than trans men, right? According to Forbes.com, as I said, I had to use international data sources. Trans women are the most vulnerable, mem vulnerable members of the trans community. 98% of transgender people murdered in the past year were trans women or trans feminine. Since 2008, the Trans Murder Mur Murdering Monitoring Report has recorded homicides, right, that happen every year since October 1st and September 30th. And this project that began 12 years ago has recorded 3,664 years, 6,000, oh, I'll say that again, 3,664 deaths. This number is rising every year. This year it was 350, up from 331 last year, right? The hate crime reports have quadrupled up by a factor of four over the past five years. Now, I'd like to say that this is something new. It's not, and I wanna say it's increasing. It's not. I don't believe that we're seeing an increase in trans violence. I think the problem's always been there and that we're seeing under and inaccurate reporting. As Afro Lackey said, right? Gender-based violence is underreported. I think reporting is increasing and getting stronger. That's why the increase. As Nancy pointed out, right? COVID-19 has caused an increase in gender-based violence and discrimination. And the UN commissioner a UN Office of the High Commissioner supports that. COVID has magnified the societal problems and mental health crises, intimate partner violence, child abuse, hate crimes, and racism. It didn't cause them, it just made unstable situations even more volatile. We're in a bad boat. The situation for trans women is far worse than it looks. Trans people are taught not to be visible. Being seen is dangerous. If we're seen, we're hurt. I'm a member of this community. I live this life. I get it. More than one in four trans women have experienced bias-driven assault and rates are higher for trans people of color. That's according to the National Center for Transgender Equity. Another survey by EGAL Canada. EGAL is the equity for lesbians and gays everywhere, right? They did this study in 2011 of 3,700 LGBTQ students. 74%, that's three quarters, of trans students in Canada face verbal harassment and 37% have faced physical harassment. And that's nine years ago when reporting was worse. This year, a gal reports 49% of trans students have experienced sexual harassment. It's not getting better, it's just getting clearer. I'm not saying it's getting worse, it's just becoming more obvious. We're seeing the problem. Now, right, I'm, let's look at the Transpulse project, right? And this is in a paper by Bauer and Scheim, it's Canadian Report, 2015. Right. The social determinants of health for transgender and gender diverse in Ontario. 20% of trans Ontarians have been physically or sexually assaulted for being trans and 34% have been verbally threatened, but not assaulted. Let's look at the elderly, 52% of 2S LGBTQI seniors fear being forced into the closet when put in residential care. They know that when they're taken out of their homes, their identity is going to be stripped. They have to suddenly become something they're not to survive. Approximately 90% of transgender and gender variant employees report experiencing workplace harassment and violence stemming from their gender identity. 
and that's from a Canadian Catalyst report of 2015. If you're trans, you're at risk, you're going to be hurt, you've got to learn to hide, right? Being seen means being hurt. And if you are hurt, there's no help, right? Um, Bauer and Schein, 2015 reported, trans people did not report to the police. 20% of harassed individuals reported, 76% do not, we're afraid. This month, the CBC reported that 2,300 women employed by the RCMP experienced sexual harassment and discrimination on gender or sexual orientation, right? In the report, Broken Dreams, Broken Lives, right? It was stated that the RCMP encourages or at least tolerates misogynistic, racist, and homophobic attitudes. So if it's that bad for people in the force, just imagine, I mean, it's beyond imagining what it's like for a victimized trans woman to ask for help. Right? Just imagine what it's like for any woman to ask for help. The police are not a place you go. The police are people you run from. Black Lives Matter taught us that. The police are not our friends, they're our enemy. They're someone to be afraid of, right? I've experienced police harassment, right? It's all part of life for a trans person, right? The basic attitude is we're guilty and pill proven innocent. The risks from seeking help outweigh the benefits we're gonna obtain. The police are not our friends. Now let's make this all worse. Transpulse Project, Right, on study under gender diverse and two-spirit indigenous people in Canada, found that 73% of indigenous women have experienced some form of violence, due, excuse me, 73% of indigenous trans women have experienced some form of violence due to transphobia and 43% reported experience physical or sexual violence. In the US, there were 38 transgender or gender non-conforming people murdered this year. 79% were Black or Latina. If you are in a marginalized community, as well as being trans, the thing falls apart. In Europe, half of the trans persons murdered this year were migrant workers. Now, it can't get worse than that, can it? Well, uh, yeah, it can. Vanderbilt University report of 2020 found that transgender people are half as likely than the average person to have a college degree. 42% of trans people experience unemployment and 31% are below the poverty rate. 25 to 40% of homeless youth in Canada are members of the 2S LGBTQI community, and it's by a gal Canada. If you're queer, your chances of finding work are way lower. Probably gonna be homeless. Well, not probably, but you have a strong chance of being homeless. Things aren't looking good. A 2013 report by the US National LGBTQ Cast Force found that the rate of unemployment for transgender persons is double the national average. 44% of trans people are underemployed and 15% make less than 10K a year. Oh, I mean, that's just like the average trans person. Like it can't happen to all of us. I have a PhD. I was employed, excuse me, I was unemployed for a year after I got fired from a job for being trans. I applied for work. I got hired after extensive camera and interviews. I wasn't actually on site, but I applied for a job, was interviewed, was hired. I showed up, I got fired day one. I spent a year on unemployment and I have a PhD in computer science, actually a desirable, reasonable thing to work in, right? I was overqualified, lacking relevant experience or a better applicant was found. If I wasn't hired by Dalhousie, I'd still be unemployed. Well, maybe I might've killed myself. I mean, it's not pretty. Being trans is awful, right? More than one in four trans people 
have lost a job due to bias, right? And this is from transequality.org. Extreme levels of unemployment for transgender people lead to one in eight, you know, becoming involved in sex work in the drug trade. Right? It's okay though, we might get lucky. We might not get killed, we can go to prison because LGBTQ people are three times as likely to be incarcerated. My data I've got from Coverdale says that Nova Institution Women for Women shows that Black, Indigenous, and 2S LGBTQI++ people are incarcerated at rates vastly exceeding their level of society re representation. 80% of people in Nova are experienced abuse and have substance abuse issues. So, right, in short, violence against trans women is real. It isn't reported and there's little help after the fact. When it intersects other areas of marginalization, the situation's far worse. Transphobia and homophobia prevent meaningful employment, further harming our lives and leading many into underground employment such as sex work or the drug trade. We become even more vulnerable after that. Addressing poverty, providing mental health care, improving physical health care, police reform, harm reduction, right? This is what we need to reduce violence and improve lives. The right to gender expression might be a protected life and protected right in Nova Scotia, but it isn't a respected right. And that's a problem. There are ways to improve this. SOG123 in BC, uh, SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identification, right? Helps early awareness of children that difference is normal. Having two moms and two dads isn't strange, right? It's known to work. Gay straight alliances in schools reduce homo and transphobia, and it's from a gal. Gender free ID is another step forward. Years ago, we put color, skin color on ID. So we could make sure that the black people sat at the back of the bus in the back of the theater. We know that's wrong. We now know that gender is wrong too. There's no reason to identify people by what they have between their legs or don't have between their legs. We know solutions, resistance is strong. I'll end by saying one thing. My best friend has two sons. One is five and the other is two. She told me she'd be happy if her sons grew up to be anything except transgender. And it's not because she has anything against transgender people. We're best friends. We've known each other for 30 years. It's because she knows what it, it would make her life's, her child's life a living hell. Violence, fear, it's all part of the transgender experience. Being trans isn't a death sentence but is filled with challenge and difficulty and nobody should have to be this way. And now Lisa, I pass it to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mara. Such, such powerful comments and the numbers are staggering. And it's, you know, it's, it's very important that we hear this and we remember this and we we talk about ways forward. So I also really appreciate that you've you've identified some some ways forward because I think it's our collective hope that change is happening, but it's too slow. Thank you so much. I'll pass um, the floor back over to Dr. Teresa Rajak Talley, who will now um, moderate the question. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, panelists. Um, there's a question here that can cover several of the speakers. Um, uh, the, the issue of the criminal justice response. I think Dr. Ross, you raised that at some point about the response of the criminal justice system. And um, Dr. Meredith, you talked about it in terms of the experiences of the transgender. And Sierra, you also mentioned it uh, the way the response was to the 1989 massacre, how it was reported. Can you elaborate a little bit about it? Uh, Dr. Ross, do you want to start? The question is the criminal justice response to gender-based violence. Sure. Uh, I've just maybe turned on, I think I've turned on my video. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. 
The uh, pro-arrest, pro-charge, and pro-prosecution policies were initiated in the 1990s, 18, 1980s, 1890s across the country. And this is the criminal justice system response. So what this means is that the pro-arrest, pro-arrest charges. So when, when a woman or anybody calls the police for a case of interpersonal or gender-based violence, the police are all obliged to lay a charge if when they suspect that their violence has occurred. So this is what is meant by pro-arrest, and this is regardless of the intention or wishes of the victim. So then, a pro so then, pro-arrest means then their charge has been laid. So then, that that sort of that leads us to pro-prosecution. Pro-prosecution then means that a it becomes part of the criminal justice system, and you would be, uh, obtain a lawyer, and then a lawyer would be the crown would be. Um, advocating for you in terms of encouraging you to lay that charge and to take it through the justice system. So we have pro-rest, pro-charge, and pro-prosecution. So you, the charge can be laid despite the wishes of the victim and then it go to pro-prosecution. So I think in many ways, the pro-rest, pro-charge, and pro-prosecution policies in this country were the result of um, a lot of lobby, a lot of advocacy by feminists to raise gender-based violence as a crime, a human rights violation, and for it to be taken seriously. And the hope was that this would result in a change in attitude towards gender-based violence in, the, in the, our country, in the culture. However, currently, I think there are a lot of issues around the pro-arrest, pro-charge, and pro-prosecution policies. And, and some may th think that this may, the engagement with the criminal justice system may be a deterrent for reporting, because it also you, it also invites the, the uh, involvement of uh, child welfare services or child protection services. So all these services, this kind of systemic and systematic response, is not, often not what people want when they when they experience gender-based violence. They want to, the violence to end, but sometimes what comes along afterwards can be a barrier, I think, to reporting. Because as I said in my uh, comments, only about uh, less than 20% report uh, experiences of gender-based violence to the police. Thank you. Afalake, you also, um, you know, in speaking about immigrant women, uh, mentioned that there was some other deterrence. Do you want to elaborate a little on that for us? Deterrence to reporting? Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Yes. Sure. Um, I mean, oftentimes the the main thing that prevents women from reporting is that you know they're in, in the context that they're going to be dealing with a racist, uh, like a system that's racist that is not that has a misconception about their culture and has sometimes uh, anti-immigrant sentiments. Um, may be, you know, sometimes one of the reasons that they may not want to re report or they themselves might have had like negative experiences with police in their home country. So coming to Canada, you, you know, they may have that kind of, um, they may that bring that over or that may carry over to here. There are also other uh, personal reasons why, you know, some women may not feel like they, you know, they, they can report. Um, because they're afraid that they're going to, you know, lose their children, um, uh, limited knowledge about laws and rights and domestic, you know, services. I don't know if I have my camera on. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, you do. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, fear of deportation, the social stigma of, you know, almost like telling on your, on your spouse, um, economic reasons, maybe they're depending solely on this you know, partner or their, their husband that, you know, they, if they were to report, they're going to feel like they're, they're going to really, um, lo lose that. Um, yeah. So there's all kinds of reasons that, uh, that, you know, women don't want feel comfortable to, to report multiple and intersecting reasons why they, they don't feel comfortable doing that. Thank you. And Dr. Meredith, uh, you, you put it very nicely when you say that, instead of running to the police, people run from them. 
So if given all these examples, you know, with Dr. Rasi and Afilaki and what you say, what are the options? Well, as a victim, right, the emphasis on the criminal system is on the perpetrator. It's about punishing the person who did it. And in many instances, the punishment's not that extreme, right? I know women who've been raped and the perpetrator got 18 months in prison. Their lives have been ruined for decades, right? Victim services, oh, you've been raped? The standard victim services response is five counseling sessions with limited counsel. You can't pick your counsel. You got to pick from their list and you have to wait for a year. You've been raped. You get one shot at getting counseling, five sessions. Meanwhile, the perpetrator, by the time you finish your counseling, they're already out of prison, right? So there's no support for victims. There's a lack of help. It's a system built on protecting the perpetrator. The perpetrator is innocent and proving until proven guilty. Meanwhile, victims are guilty until proven innocent. The victims don't get the support. They don't get the help. They don't, they're lost and their lives start falling apart. Yes, many of them fall into substance abuse problems and then they become criminalized as a result. The system doesn't recognize the brutality that victims face, how cruel and awful it is to be the victim of violence, intimate partner violence, rape, domestic violence. None of the, your children see it. Women are devastated by what happened to their, you know, the lives that their children are going to face moving on, right? This is not an issue that needs more punishment. This is an issue that needs better support for those people who have been harmed. That's all I can say. Thank you. I, I, um, talking about the need for better support and recognition of gender-based violence, Sierra, what is the situation with the engineering profession given that violent history of those young women who were killed? Is it recognized? Is it still there? Uh, what's the impact? Yeah, so um, the December 6th uh, Montreal massacre is still, you know, it's still very much felt very deeply in the engineering community, both, you know, in the academic community, but also in the profession. And it's very much, you know, um, that's what people think of when we think of gender-based violence. That's very much the first thing that comes to mind. And I think that it's a very, very important reminder, um, especially that it was only 30 years ago that, you know, gender-based violence is a very dangerous issue. And it's something that affects, you know, people, uh, you know, in that sense, it was very targeted to women in engineering. But um, like I mentioned before, it was also, uh, you know, it wasn't just women in engineering. It was also a nursing student and um, someone who was working at the university. And it's very much felt across, um, you know, as an engineering student, um, I know that this is, you know, I think about it a lot and about how scary that must have been to be in a profession you know, where that, you know, that could happen. And uh, I have to remind myself that that was only 30 years ago and that um, it's still really important to be thinking about how this is impacting our profession. And uh, when people are uh, doubting that gender-based violence is an issue, um, you know, I, I usually just point them to that example um, as, a first, as a first case, because again, 30 years is really, not a long time when you really think about it. Yeah, well, let me say that we are so proud of our, our students here tonight on the panel and of all the panelists, but particularly our student engineers. And um, Rowan, 
What would you say about the same question when asked? Do you mind repeating it? Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I was talking about the impact of the history of violence among the engineering students, you know? What is the current situation? How is the response? What advice would you give to someone who is experiencing uh, barriers and difficulties that are linked to uh, gender-based violence? Um, so I can remember back, so I'm one of those individuals that like knew at a young age I wanted to be an engineer uh, because I just was determined to be something that men were, like that's the kind of mentality I had as a kid. Um, and now I'm a non-binary person, so it's kind of funny. But um, I remember every year my school would talk about what happened on December 6th and just my body being overwhelmed with chills and how much it, it affects me. And still, I still wear the ribbon on my backpack and just looking at all the women's faces and their names, like that could have been me. Like a few years ago, if I had been born a bit earlier, my Nana was in the STEM industry like as a young woman like that could have been her um it could have been any of us and it's just that's why i'm here that's why i'm pushing and it's honestly kind of triggering to think about for me and so if you feel that way you're not alone but you belong here right thank you um that's any one of the other panelists want to respond to a similar question? What advice would you give? What can we do both on the campus and in the community, given the current situation where the gender-based violence is not really decreasing? In some cases, it's increasing because of COVID. And as Dr. Meredith also pointed out, even if it's not increasing, it's becoming clearer. So, any recommendations to what we should be doing in the community as well as on the campus? I'll leave it open. Don't make me have to call somebody. There we go, Dr. Marilyn. Your, your speaker is off. You need to turn your speaker on. Thank what you. we have to do, we have to make easier for people to speak up. And we've got to stop the slap on the wrist behavior. It happened somewhere on this campus this year that a teaching assistant was sexually inappropriate with, a, with one of their students. The teaching assistant got a slap on the wrist and got told, don't do that again. That's not the approach we need. This student, this teaching assistant, should have been extricated from the university. What they did was wrong. And we just can't go, well, oops, they made a mistake. The woman they hurt is going to be harmed for the rest of their life. There is no way we can fix this. But just to say, oops, it was a mistake. We're brushing it under the rug. We are letting, and I, I don't want to speak against Al House, but I'm saying we're letting tuition drive our choices. We're letting the need for more students harm our protection of some of our most vulnerable students. We have to act strongly passionately and actively. And then when a student is hurt, we don't focus on the perpetrator. We have to focus on the hurt student. How do we provide them support? How do we move them forward? How do we keep them in our community in a safe and positive manner? Let's not focus on the perpetrators. Let's focus on the victims, the survivors. Let's give them the tools to exceed and excel in our community. These are the people that need us more than anything. Without us, they're lost. And I can't say strong enough that we've got to step up and find these lost individuals and give them everything we've got under the umbrella because they were hurt on our watch. And if we can't be there, 
or watch is meaningless? I want to go even younger to a younger group. And this questions, I think, Afulaki and um, maybe Dr. Ross could also address it. But Afulaki, um, the question uh, that is before us is that, um, you know, how can we talk to children about gender-based gender violence? It's a, a very complex, you know, conversation to have, I would say, with, with children. Um, however, I believe that, you know, the proactive way of starting early to help, you know, little children identify, you know, their, their like know their rights in regards to um, what they can or cannot accept in relation to even like their body from like from early on is important and calling body parts what the na exact name is instead of giving it like you know different names that um, as someone who may be looking to exploit or take advantage of a child can can use that um, I mean it would have to be on a you know a, a like a, an age appropriate conversation. I mean, if you're talking to um, a grade primary student, you, you know, I would say starting small uh, by maybe starting off naming their body parts and using the name that it's meant for it to be. And, you know, making sure that they have, um, they feel comfortable uh, with regards to asking questions about that. And, you know, when you're dealing with someone who's maybe, you know, 10 years old, you have a different conversation about keep, you know, making sure that they finding ways to um, not put themselves in situation that someone could take advantage of them. Um, and if they, if they notice anything that is, you know, uh, that makes them feel uncomfortable to make sure that they are able to talk to their, their parents or identify a teacher in the in the school that they can they can share that with. Um, and the thing with with that too is is not only um, perpetrated by you know adult to children. There are times that it's like peer to peer uh, as a result of what sometimes children are watching online these days without supervision and the access that some children have to certain inappropriate. Um, uh, things. So, you know, it's, you know, it, the onus is on, I believe, you know, caregivers to uh, ensure that, you know, the children are well, you know, supervised when they're accessing anything online or the internet and having a, a you know, a, what do you call it, a, a parent proof sort of um, software on, on their computer and have like having conversations with the children about, you know, when you're working on your computer, like having a set place where, you know, children can sit and work where easily, like in our home, it's in, in the kitchen area and everyone has access. You're walking around and you, you see what's going on, like finding what works for your family. But I guess starting to have those conversations early to try and keep your child safe and using the appropriate words and encouraging your child to you know, come and talk to you whenever they feel unsafe or uncomfortable with someone. And, and Dr. Ross, there's a question here about um, the trauma that children experience in homes that have gender-based violence. Can you uh, share some of your research on that? I was just I was just jotting down some responses to the former question. So yeah, this is that's this fine. Go ahead. You can, you can <laughs> do both. The new question. Uh, as I um, was mentioned in, in the introduction, uh, I have been doing some research around adverse childhood experiences, and one of those so adverse childhood experiences acknowledges the range of adversity that children grow up with, uh, often. Um, there's a dose impact. So children may experience some level of physical abuse themselves or sexual abuse. And they may also um, find in terms of their families that their parents have um, 
challenges. And one of those adverse childhood experiences is witnessing uh, gender-based violence. So the, the science, if people are interested in this, looking at the science and looking at the growth of research around adverse childhood experiences can really help. And, and I, would, I would recommend Nadine Burke Harris. She has a TED talk looking at the impact of stress on children and how it ripples through their lives unless it's addressed. So it can result in toxic stress and toxic stress can have a result uh, physically psychologically, emotionally. And as Avalaki uh, mentioned, it, it can uh, impact uh, their ability to have healthy relationships themselves in, in adulthood. So it has multiple impacts. And um, if, you go to, if you go to that TED talk, I think you would find uh, a lot of information related to um, toxic stress. Thanks. Um. We have a few more minutes and uh, while the questions are popping in, um, is there anyone on the panel who would like to add something to the conversation or something they wanted to say and did not have the time? Just go I, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I would love to add that I kind of differ in opinion to a previous panelist in terms that I don't think it's that hard to explain or not even, you don't have to explain to children. Um, we teach the binary. We teach them this binary. So it's not about explaining to them or unexplaining this binary. It's about never introducing them to it or preparing them to be introduced to it in the outside world and letting them just be who they are. Um, fortunately, my parents all picked gender fluid names for my siblings and I and were quite um they relied quite heavily on our consent especially in, as, even in spirituality um and with that in mind it's just letting the kid be themselves who they want to be it's not so much explaining to them that there's so much it's just not explaining to them that there's two how can you protect them from the violence and even kids who uh you know, kids are not all these nice little angels, you know, so what do you tell your child in terms of protecting them from this kind of stereotype and violence? I see Dr. Meredith has um, video on, so you wanted to jump in and say something there? It's also not about protecting children, but about giving them the information they need to understand the world. When they understand the world, violence no longer becomes a necessity. Violence is a result of confusion, of fear, of being afraid. When you see that your friend has two moms or two dads, and that's okay, you're okay. When you see that your friend wears a dress, even though it's he's, she is a boy, and I don't know what pronoun to assign to this person, and it doesn't matter. When you see that they're a human being and not a gender or a role or a stereotype, when you recognize that there's nothing to be afraid of, homophobia and transphobia become irrelevant. When you recognize that human beings are humans, that difference is okay. Difference isn't to be afraid of. It's not something to be running from. Difference is to be embraced and accepted. And you don't have to teach young children that homophobia or being gay or queer or anything is okay. You teach them that other people are different and they don't have to be scared of that difference. They don't have to understand why the difference exists. They just have to accept that it exists. And once you accept, the fear goes away and our ability to navigate this world becomes stronger. Doug Ford in Ontario just moved the idea that sexual orientation needs to be moved to grade eight. 
children observe this much younger. And it's the age at which you observe it. We have to tell you what you're observing isn't wrong, just different. Not good, not bad, not, it's nothing. It's just different. And there's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, little Pete has two dads. Little Mary has two moms. Who cares? Just the way it is. And when you no longer think of it as a problem, just part of stuff. Well, now that we are talking about the young people, not that we are all not young, but um, there's a question here about gender-based violence in cyberspace on the internet. Uh, would anybody like to address that particular question? I mean, have you experienced it? What do we do with cyber uh, gender-based violence? Dr. Ross, do you have any research on that? Yes, uh, cyber bullying or cyber violence and gender violence on uh, cyber sexualized violence is a huge problem. And I think part of the issue is that people that um, initiate it often feel removed uh, from the impact of it because it is cyber, it's virtual. And so sometimes it's harder to address. And a well-known case in our province was with Retea Parsons. So Retea Parsons is a young woman who experienced cyber-based bullying after um, a horrific sexual assault and ended up um, taking her own life. And in, in the analysis of her whole situation, cyberbullying was uh, at the root of, of her distress. And also a case in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia where um, many, um, there was a, a case where young um, men were charged uh, with distributing pornography because um, they had been distributing images of young women. Um, and, and that case went to court. And what happened there in, in terms of uh, how it was handled in schools and in the community was um, very vitriolic in terms of uh, many people uh, insulted each other there was much hurt and it wasn't um, taken up uh, with young women and young men that were involved in a way that was constructive and that was oriented towards resolving conflict. So I think we as, um, we as communities need to have um, facilitators who can aptly uh, lead conversations to address these issues in ways that, um, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Meredith just mentioned, um, says that, you know, we're, we're all human and uh, that we're all in this together. Yeah, thank you. I want to um, go back to Sierra. Sierra, you raised a very interesting concept because when we think gender-based violence, we've been focused a lot on the physical and psychological and social dimensions and even the health dimensions. But you spoke about, you know, in the discipline, our research, and how that can be interpreted as gender-based violence. And I think that's extremely important for you to understand. We have come to some, some progress in the medical sciences, because historically we've been arguing that the medical sciences is based on the male body and biology. And we are now coming to recognize that certain symptoms differ by gender. But nobody has really switched that focus to say engineering and the other sciences. So explore for us a little more of how, you know, when we talk about gender-based balance, it's not just only about the physical, the social, the mental and the health, but what we do in terms of research and innovation. Yeah, so I think that, you know, the ways that we design things, and this goes I mean, as an engineering student, I'm definitely most familiar with engineering case studies, but this goes, you know, beyond that in terms of how our buildings are designed. A really big issue is in washroom design. Um, you know, uh, women often have less space to use the bathroom because, um, you know, a lot of uh, space that's in, you know, men's bathrooms might be taken up with urinals and not everyone is able to use those. Um, and, 
you know, that gives them more space to use the washroom and women are left waiting in lines. Um, there's a lot of research that's been shown to uh, show this. And there is actually an interesting case study that um, when, you know, making gender neutral bathrooms, uh, you know, a lot of places will actually be replacing the women's bathrooms uh, and just make those the gender neutral bathrooms. Um, but a problem with that is that that doesn't necessarily provide a safe space for um, non-binary people who, uh, you know, need to use the washroom. Uh, but on top of that, you know, that also allows anyone to be using those bathrooms rather than, you know, men having their own bathrooms. And it's kind of the little things like that that are really important to be considering in our designs and when we're making these designs. Um, speaking from experience, I know that the Sexton campus, the engineering campus, um, before our big renovations had no gender neutral bathrooms. And that was an extremely big problem. Um, and, you know, the lack of women's bathrooms, uh, you know, it was, uh, and it still is a very, uh, you know, men dominated field, but, uh, simple things like that in the ways that we're designing our buildings. And like I mentioned with the car, car crashes and when we're designing algorithms and feeding it data that is typically from, you know, able-bodied cis men, um, that's not representative of the whole population. And we really need to be considering how designing these systems is insinuating violence against other populations. And, and I do strongly support that. That is always uh, my two peeves. I think men design kitchen cupboards and mammogram machines. I know a female did not design those mammogram machines. So, I mean, we, we are smiling and joking about it, but it's a serious issue because we are pointing out the most obvious and silly examples to some extent. But you raise an extremely important point that as a university, that is conducting research and innovation, not just Dalhousie, but generally, we have to look at the patents, traditions, and focus of these because they are interpreted as gender-based violence. Before I close, I see Rowan, you have your camera on. You will have the last word before I do the closing. How special, it's not that important. <laughs> I was just going to add on Sierra's Mm -hmm. um, so we go to the same school one night, my friend and I, there's a scale in the woman's washroom. One night we picked that scale up and we put it in the men's washroom. The next morning it was back in the women's washroom. So it's, how do you value us? Is it by our, is it our bodies? And, and are you, are you conditioning us to value our bodies over our brains? That was just what I was going to add because our school does that too. Thank you. It's interesting that my first experience with engineering was about the washrooms and we're ending on the washrooms of this forum. But to end on a more serious note, um, you know, we started this forum out of the need to speak truth to power in a collective voice with our BIPOC communities. The conversations from the very first to this or very last for this year, 2020, were always difficult and filled with pain. Unfortunately, we must also end the series of this year with a painful true life story of Martha Martin. And I would like to dedicate this um, episode to Martha Martin and all the mothers who have lost children, not just under the COVID, but under violence. Um, Martha Martin, we learned, is preparing for the funeral of another child Martha Martin is the mother of Chantel Moore, the young woman who was shot and killed in Edmonston, New Brunswick, by the New Brunswick police during a wellness check last June. She's now making another long journey back to the West Coast homeland after receiving word that her son, Chantel's Moore brother, just died. He was just 23 and was found deceased in a city jail cell after an apparent suicide. Martha explained that her son has been struggling lately, but he had hopes and dreams. She said, my son was living on the streets. He struggled with addiction, got himself in trouble and ended up in jail. But the young man had hopes for the future. According to Michael, 
I did not plan on staying in the streets, but here I am. I hate it. I would like for people to help, to give me a chance, but most people look at me with disgust. Martha said that she spoke to her son in early November, about 10 days before his death. Through her, through her tears, she said, you never think you will lose two of your kids, one shot by cops and one in jail. How does this happen? How does this happen? Gender-based violence, race and ethnic-based violence, how does this happen? And I would like to thank you, the panelists, for helping us go through this trauma and by answering some of the questions and creating more questions. The panelists tonight and the panelists for the past four episodes, we thank you. We thank you, the participants, for being here. And we thank all our sponsors, including the Women and Gender Studies, who are co-sponsors, co-sponsoring this event tonight. I would like to also especially thank the women who volunteer and continue to volunteer with me for this forum. Rihel, April, and Amina, can you please put on your camera so we can see the faces behind the scene? Don't be shy. A lot of people want to thank you guys. This is a volunteer forum. Thank you so much. Woo! Yeah, and it's not, it's not been an easy one. And as we talk about trauma and pain, you know, we do have the human rights and equity staff who helps us through all of this. And so I'd also like to thank and dedicate this episode to our HRAS staff, who despite all the pain and trauma and stresses, remain committed and hopeful. So HRAS staff, please put on your camera, Lisa and Crystal. Lisa, Crystal, Amina, April, Riel, Kathy. Yeah, we just want to say thanks. And to all of you out there, please stay safe, be well, and find peace over the break. And see you next year. Thank you. There's our last slide advertising our human rights and equity conference on Friday, 